Hello everybody and welcome to another teaching video. This is part of a series where we're looking at not just the Bible, but really how to understand the Bible, how to make sense of the Bible. The subject that we're covering today is the difference between Greek thought and Hebrew thought. You may already know, you may have watched one of the other videos that's explained it to you, but in case you haven't, the New Testament is written in Greek and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And these two cultures have a different way of writing things down, a different way of explaining things. Now, some of the interesting nuances I think we see with the scriptures is that even though it's written in Greek, so it contains a lot of Greek thought by this time, it's still written by Jewish people, so they sometimes carry some of their Hebrew thoughts into the New Testament. But I want to just give you today some quick examples and help you be able to understand what the difference is between Greek thought and Hebrew thought. The first prop that I've got for us today to have a look at is a pen. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I can bring this too close to the camera because it will go out of focus. But I hope that you can see this enough. that you'll be able to make out its detail, that you're able to see what it looks like. And I'd like you to take just a few seconds in your head to think how you would describe this pen. If you're at home watching the video, maybe just say to the person next to you, how you think you would describe this pen. Whilst you're doing that, I'll explain to you that we are Greek thinkers. A lot of what we think these days comes from that, those Greek teachers, Greek philosophy. We are Greek thinkers. That means that we probably describe this pen as long, thin, black. It's got bits of metal. On it, it's got a, a bit at the end and it's got a, a metal bit at the front and it's got a, a metal clip on it as well. That's how I describe this pen anyway, because I'm a Greek thinker. If I was to ask this question of a Hebrew person, the type of Hebrew person who would have written the Old Testament, well, first of all, they'd have had to figure out what a pen was. And once they had done that, they would have described it by saying, it writes. Greek thinking is quite abstract. We're interested in aesthetics and things like this. Hebrew thought. Well, Hebrew thought's interested in function. What something does. What its purpose is. So they would say, it writes. My second prop I've got for you, to see if you're on board with this yet, is a mug. Now this is one of my favourite mugs, it's a posh mug, because this was a Christmas present from my little brother and my sister-in-law. Bear in mind what I've just explained about the pen. How would a Greek person describe this mug? And how would a Hebrew thinking person describe this mug. Now of course you're all spot on now, you're quick learners. A Greek thinking person would have said, well it's it's grey, it's got a handle, it's kind of the colour toning of the grey changes as it goes around and they would have said it's a beautiful mug because it was given in love from your brother Jason. A Hebrew person would have said it contains water. A Hebrew thinking Jason would say it should be containing my coffee, but it seems to be empty. It's about what the mug does rather than what it looks like. So I need to put this into some kind of scriptural context for you. And to do so, I'm going to read from Exodus, Exodus 
chapter 32. Now what's happened in Exodus chapter 32 is that Moses is on Mount Sinai being given the law of the covenant by God. And down below, the people at the beginning of this chapter, they've started to tire of waiting around. So if you know this story, they start to make um, golden calves out of jewellery, which basically is saying that they've started to worship another god. They got bored of waiting for Yahweh up on the mountain, even though he'd done incredible things for them. And very quickly, they've lost sight of all of that. And they think, well, let's get us another god and see how that works for us. Moses comes down the mountain and he's furious. And this is what verse 19 says. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his nose burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his nose burned. Why on earth did Moses' nose burn? That doesn't make sense. Did he get too close to the flames? Actually, what I did is I took the Hebrew word there and placed it into our English translation. The Hebrew word nose also means anger. So when you see that passage in Hebrew, it tells us that his nose burned. In English, we read that his anger burned. Why on earth does it say his nose burns then when they mean anger? It's because if I was to say to you, can you describe to me anger? Well, it's an emotion. It's, it's feelings. It's, it's, I don't know. It's abstract. So a Hebrew thinking person says, oh, I can describe it to you. Your nostrils flare. That's what happens when you become angry. Your nostrils flare and you start to breathe more deeply through your nose. So their word for anger is nose. And you can find this all throughout the Old Testament. Why don't you check it out? The New Testament tells us to pray in the name of Jesus. Have you ever wondered why? Is it a magic word? You know, I remember uh, growing up, the magic words like abracadabra, and you'd say it all, and you'd think that something was going to happen. Well, is that the same thing for the word Jesus? I may have said before, but then it's even a bit more confusing when you consider that people all around the world, loads of people are called Jesus. Do they have a magic name? Then you've got to consider Jesus' name. When he walked and talked to, uh, as a Jewish man, his name wasn't Jesus. It was Yeshua. That's the Jewish name that Jesus actually had. It's Yeshua. So should we pray in the name of Yeshua? And when we, we pray, we'll say, in the name of Yeshua, and something will happen. It's not what it means at all. It's not a magic word. The name in Hebrew thought is a character. The name Jesus or Yeshua, when you track it back, means salvation. His character, who he is, is the saviour. When Jesus changes people's names, when God changes people's names, he's making them a new creation, he's giving them a new character. When we pray in the name of Jesus, it doesn't mean that we have to keep repeating Jesus. Because it's nothing to do with saying a name. It's about knowing who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he has promised to do in the future. It's about recognising Jesus' supreme, sovereign authority. It's about recognising Jesus as saviour. It's about recognising Jesus as king. 
It's about recognising Jesus who has power and dominion over all things, including those spirits that try and work against him. They are nothing compared to Jesus. They are lesser beings. So when we speak in the name of Jesus, what we do is we bring the character of Jesus into the prayer. We bring the authority of Jesus into the prayer and we bring that love of Jesus into prayer. When we pray in the name of Jesus, my word, we hurl love into that prayer. And that is the power of it. Not just saying a name. For your final test, your final examination today, to see if you've learned what it is I'm trying to talk to you about, I'm going to bring you one verse of scripture and see if you can figure out the meaning of that verse. It's quite a well-known verse. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says this, God said, let us make humankind or mankind in our image. Let us make them in our likeness. This is one of those verses that I hear many people speak about. It's kind of got one of those verses that we use for inclusivity these days. It, we talk about it with diversity. We talk about it with all kinds of things where we're all contained within the image of God. Let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. Does that mean that God uh, looks a bit like me? Does God look like you? Who does God look like? But surely this must mean that God's got two eyes, a nose, a mouth, two ears, two legs, two arms. Well, that doesn't work if you're disabled and you don't have those things. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? If you're a Hebrew thinker, to be made in this image of this cup, if I was to make another cup in this image, I wouldn't care what it looks like. I'd care what it did. It's got a purpose. And all cups have the same purpose. It's to contain some kind of liquid so we can drink out of it. To be made in the image of God is a profound statement about our function. This verse comes in the first creation narrative. It's getting towards the very end of the creation narrative, the sixth day, the culmination of all that God is going to be made. And he says this, I'm going to make humanity and I'm going to make them in our image, in our own likeness. Let me read the rest of that verse to you. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. This passage is not at all about image as we see it as Greek thinking people. It's so much better than that. It's about saying that God has created you in his image, which means please do the work of God. Have that function. Be creative. Bring perfection to the world. That message continues into our New Testament. When Jesus gives disciples, his apostles, instructions to do exactly what he had been doing. Paul says to us, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. He's moving it from the Hebrew thought and helping us understand what it means to be made in the image of God and explains to us in the Greek thought, be an imitator of me as I am an imitator of Christ. What a beautiful way to start the Bible to be made in the image, the function of God.
to do godly things, to look after this world, to create, to stamp out injustice, to heal, to love, to share, to make sure that this is a wonderful place to live for all of humanity and for all the animals, for everything in the sky, everything that crawls along the ground even. Our job is to steward over all of that and make sure that creation itself functions well.